Welcome, everyone, to Episode 7 of Above the Fold, the podcast powered up by Brafton. As always, you got Francis Ma, the creative genius, and Jeff Baker, who likes numbers and, you know, talks about numbers every once in a while. Um, as always, you got both of us talking about content marketing, the do's, the don'ts, and the dirty. Uh, we will be talking about three different things. Um, we like to give vague words or phrases to kind of give you all a heads up as to what they are. Today's three vague words, and Jeff, I'm realizing we need a better phrase than vague words. Um, maybe by episode 12, we can figure it out. Um, for now, today's words are Trump, virtual, and die. Um, each topic will have a 20 second download where uh, one of us will have uh, 20 seconds to kind of react to the question and uh, go off from there. And then we attempt to have an intelligent conversation afterwards. Jeff Baker, are you uh, no. are you ready? No, I'm not ready. Can we talk about no, my intro? Not ready at all. We, my, my intro <laughs> really is hurtful. Um, Every time. You don't know Every this, time. Episodes but, like, you know, five, six, and seven, I think I handled the intro, and I now have the power to say whatever I want. You're in a powerful position, and um, I think you're mistreating it, to be honest. Uh, I've been logging each one of these insults, and I'm collecting them. <laughs> I'm collecting them in a book, and I address them every night in my journal, and I try to work through these issues. And you just keep adding to them, one per week. You're setting me behind. I... In my personal development. When do I get a copy of this book? Do I get a copy of this book on my birthday? And is it called Why I Cry by Jeff Baker? Subhead, My Life Story. Uh, it is. And it's, I'm self-publishing. what it's called? I'm self-publishing on Amazon, which is just another way people use <laughs> of saying, I know this would never get published through a real publisher. So I'm self-publishing on Amazon. <laughs> Come on, man. A lot of people publish on Amazon. Don't. Don't dog on him. I might publish on Amazon someday. And you know what? Maybe I'll even write the companion book to your book, Why I Make Jeff Baker Cry, um, A Life's Mission by Francis Ma. And you is... know what? I'm writing that down. I'm going to write it tonight. It's not going to be that hard. I've already, I've got episodes worth of, uh, of data to kind of pull from. Practically writes itself. This is bad chatter. I think we need to move on. Jeff Baker, <laughs> you ready for your first 20 second download? Pouting, but ready. Yeah, let's go. Okay. This one is news-based. Here we go. President Trump has accused Google of returning biased political news results. True or false? <laughs> go. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, all right. Well, I know Facebook and Twitter got caught up in the past for doing that. Um, doctoring the results so left-leaning political commentary would pop up above right-leaning political commentary. So I, I know that's a possibility. However, I know. And you're from, done. Well, I, and you know, you're man, done I, from the I, second you, know you said, however, <laughs> I knew you were screwed. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't even have a chance on that one. I am. I am so lost. I on one. <laughs> uh, all right. On one hand, the guy will say some of the craziest crap that you can ever think of. And it's just like, it's like, what are you? Are you kidding me? It's like, are you just like putting ideas in a washing machine and just pulling out whatever, you know, whatever falls out first. <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, I know is I just read um, a book recently where they, they talked about how they called out Twitter and they, how they called out Facebook for doctoring the yeah. results and actually pushing up the, the liberal biased articles to the top of the feed. And that kind of makes sense because we're out here in the Silicon Valley. It's all, West Coast, and it's very, very left leaning, especially in the tech space. Like you, you are not. There's a really good episode if any of you watch Silicon Valley on HBO. Um, <laughs> this guy, yeah, uh, I know which one you're talking about. Okay, yeah. there's an episode where the man he uh, outed himself as gay, and then everyone's like, "Oh, we don't care." Obviously, that doesn't yeah. matter. And then inadvertently, um, the main character Richard outed him as being Catholic. And everybody just <laughs> freaked out. And they're like, we can't, oh, no, we can't have this guy on the team. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's weird out here. You know, it's like it's not, um, it is not right-leaning. It is, it is very left-leaning. And it was, you know, um, without getting into actual politics, we will say that Twitter and Facebook came up against that. And the only reason why I have any, you know, possible suspect doubt in this story of, the, of it being true is that 
Google's right in between those two. I mean, it's smack dab in the, the heart, the bleeding heart of tech Silicon Valley left leaning uh, part of the country is Google. So I don't know, man. I don't know. It's interesting too because I mean, um, you and I saw found this in like less than an hour ago. You know uh, about you know this uh, Donald uh, President Trump talking about Google search and. And how that, you know, is essentially his, his reputation or the, the negative news is popping up every time uh, in, in Google. And it's interesting to kind of see something unfold. Who knows how this unfolds, you know, after today. Maybe this is something you and I touch base again after Labor Day next week. Um, but in general, you know, for one, it's interesting that this is coming up. It's interesting that there are different perspectives on Google search and how, you know, the spectrum of it can, can vary wildly. I also think this is a good way to bring up something um, uh, called reputation management. Because in general, take politics out of it, take the president out of it. Um, the idea behind a company or an organization putting you know, their keyword or their name into Google search and coming up against a lot of negative, call it reviews or stories or conspiracies, um, you know, they, they want to be able to kind of mitigate that, change it. Um, which, you know, in, in the past for some clients has been, you know, reputation management. Um, I think the basic question is, does that work? Is it possible to manage one's online reputation through Google search slash SEO? I, I mean, this is kind of like an old school strategy. People used to do all kinds of stuff to get around that, yeah. um, from creating, uh, microsites, which those of you aren't not familiar with a <laughs> microsite Francis, apparently you are. <laughs> um, if I, to, that's why I'm giggling, yeah. Yeah, if, if you were to, like, I'm xyzcompany.com, um, and everything underneath my result is, like, xyzcompany.com scam, xyzcompany.com ripoff <laughs> report, um, and they come and they say, hey, you know, we get some, we're getting some bad press here, and surely if they're getting reported that badly, they've probably earned it. Um, however, uh, back in the old days of SEO, we're talking like 2011, 2012, you'd set up microsites. So it'd be like the name of the company and in the URL and something else, like it would be xyzcompanyreviews.com and Google would be like, oh, it's, you know, it's in the name of the URL and possibly push down those other results, uh, favoring this particular result. And then on that site, you would populate it with whatever choice stuff that you wanted. And the whole idea was you just shove all the bad reviews onto page two and you, you know, your prospects aren't going to see them again. So that said, that was 2011. And, <laughs> you know, Google's smarter than that. Now you're, you're not going to be able to, if you're popping up on ripoffreport.com, um, <laughs> you're going to have to, yeah, you're going to, you have to deal with those complaints. You, that's the answer. You, you deal with the complaints, uh, however possible. Yeah. And then if you do a good job of dealing with those complaints, maybe they'll be gracious enough to pull them down from that site and you won't pop up as much. Maybe. But I mean, the funny thing is going back to the microsite, you know, era, if there was such a thing, um, the, the weird thing is, is that it would work every once in a while. Like it wouldn't it work did. forever. But there, there would be, you know, times where it was pushed down off page one. It was technically possible. Um, but you, like you said, 2011, 2012, um, it's a different landscape now. You know, no way that works with, um, with, with Google and their, their, their algorithm. Um, it's interesting that for a while that was actually kind of a strategy that worked. Um, which kind of brings us to today. I mean, I always thought that there was no way just in terms of reputation management, that there's no way to kind of combat that with SEO alone. You know, you kind of have to go even old school, older school strategy and, you know, bring up old school advertising, uh, old school, you know, getting a certain, me positioning a certain message out there that goes even beyond what some people would read online. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's a pop-up, maybe it's some sort of ad campaign, something like that. I just, I don't, I think it's kind of like a, a full-on assault that you have to do in order to do something um, that, that moves the needle the other way. Um, I don't think it's as easy as just, hey, this is a new uh, SEO strategy we're going to use and things are going to change. It's just not going to be that, that. It's not going to be like that. Let me take it in a different direction for 
the last portion of the segment here because we're talking about whether or not Google would censor its results or censor it. Okay. Yeah, I guess this is we're talking censorship, right? Um, they're, they got into some hot water a couple of years ago. I don't know if you read this article. It was on Search Engine Land. Um, there was a website. Um, I think it was Daily Stormer or something like that. Stormfront. Um, if you mm. had searched, and we're going to get fully political now, as long as we're into it. And this was a, I think it's, <laughs> I think it's fair game because this was a big topic, and they got put into hot water. So we're going to, we should talk about it. Um, there for questions um, of did the Holocaust happen, there would be results that popped up of websites that were Holocaust denier websites. Um, and the reason why they popped up is because the, the way that their algorithm worked, um, they had you know, the right combination of metrics to make them the most prominent search results and the strongest, uh, to, to show up. So they had the, the most backlinks, they had the highest domain authority, they had all those things that we talk wow. about that are ranking signals. And yeah. obviously like this is, this is a bit of a problem, uh, in two ways, because Holocaust denial is bad for one, and two, <laughs> censorship is bad too. So if you go in there and auto- <laughs> and just doctor things based on um, you know uh, individual individuals doctoring the algorithm as opposed to the algorithm fixing yeah, itself, yeah. then you you actually are censoring. Right or wrong, you are actually censoring. Um, and then a uh, short time afterwards. All of a sudden, those articles were gone. They were pushed to page two. So I guess the question here, and it's a very interesting question, is, is it okay um, to to remove something, to censor something, if you know it to be untrue? If it's without a doubt something that's untrue, can you remove it from the results? Even though, based on your algorithm, it belongs there. It belongs there. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's even a deeper question as to, I mean... There's so many things that are un- beyond, you know, being getting political. There's so many other things that are untrue that's published online. You know, are we are we actually talking about a police, you know, an Internet police in the sense of, well, this is clearly true versus this other thing. And only I don't know. I don't I'm not, I don't have an answer here. I'm just speculating. But um, it feels like that's that's where you're running toward. Uh, yeah, it is. And, and very open to comments on this from listeners, uh, please do write to us. Obviously we are, um, we are not, we are intentionally not taking any political side whatsoever. We are strictly bringing up the facts of the argument brought up and, um, you know, trying to elicit some sort of, uh, some sort of response from people and try to get a conversation going on, you know, what, um, how do, how do people feel about this? How do people feel about Google potentially altering the algorithm to, um, you know, to censor some of these things that are deemed to be false um, versus just letting it run its course and treating all websites the same. So yeah, I'd love to, love to hear back from the crowd on this one because it's a, it's a pretty sensitive topic and it, it made a lot of waves when it came up. And as I'm sure this Trump discussion is going to make a lot of waves as well. People get very, very passion and passionate uh, when they impassioned impassionate. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> Where's my English major over there uh, when talking about these types of things? So we want we want to hear from you on it. I agree. I want to hear from everyone, too. And I'd like to reiterate that it was Jeff Baker who brought this up <laughs> and not me. Let's move on to number two. All right. Number two is uh, coming to you, Francis. And this right. is this is this is virtual. OK, right. Virtual, Question. The vague term. What were the last three things you asked your virtual assistant to do for you? Go. <laughs> um, uh, okay, uh, music. Uh, I asked, I have an Alexa. I asked Alexa to play uh, music. Um, I asked Alexa to put a timer on, essentially put the kids in timeout, you know, five minutes, six minutes. And um, uh, third Time. thing is actually, I heard about this. Ah, oh, dang. Ah. Okay. Uh, first question. Did you I lie? had a third. I had a third thing. Did you lie about any of these things? No, I did not. I absolutely <laughs> did not. Okay. Yeah, uh, music and timeout are absolutely regular occurrences in the Ma household. All right. Um let's let's jump through the third these. thing. Oh yeah, yeah. Jump into your third thing. Go. Let me go into the third thing. This, this I, I was I just read about it uh, about a week ago and I wanted to try it out. It was I asked Alexa to uh to put on a way mode. So she could have a fake conversation um, 
to make would-be burglars run away from the house because they would think people were there. I've got so many <laughs> questions. Oh my god. <laughs> let's let's take this it's one a, at a time. A I need skill. to I need to it's pace myself okay. here. Let's take this one at a time. All right, all right, all right. What music did you ask Alexa to play for you? So at home, typically when I'm like washing dishes or whatever, I have Spotify. I put on um, Country Coffee House, which is like one of their built-in uh, playlists. Um, it's just soothing. It's nice to have in the background. It doesn't like interfere with any of my inner thoughts when I have, when I'm trying to think about other ways to make you cry, it doesn't really, you know, distract me. Oh. It's, but it's, I, I also can't do any housework in silence either. I need something going on. So more often than not, it's, um, it's that playlist that I like. Okay. So, and we've already discussed previously, your outsourcing your parental duties to Skynet. Every so parent. Every parent with an Alexa, I promise you, does that. Yeah. You know, th there's probably other ways to utilize Alexa in terms of parenting, but using the timer for timeout is perfect because What's the kids already know what that alarm sounds like. And the second it goes off, you hear this chorus of, no, <laughs> we have to go to bed or no, we got to, we got to read from Jeff Baker's book again. Why do we got to do that? It's, um, <laughs> it's, it's a slippery slope, mister. Either way. I mean, what's what's next? <laughs> they, are you gonna are you gonna have Alexa read your bedtime books to to your children? I'm sure before there's a way bed? to do that. I'm, I'm I, sure, I'm sure there there's is. a way to a way to do that. <laughs> that. You know what? It might get to a point where you don't even have to see your children again. Alexa might just Hey, hey there. You know? Hey there. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Alexa, take a picture of my child when she looks really cute today. Like, you know, that's right. yeah, that's coming right. for you. Good for you. Good for you. <laughs> Um, all right, let's, uh, let's move on to the, uh, the third that you weren't quite able to get out. What was that one again? Remind me. So it's a new skill that's in Alexa. Now you have to, uh, essentially, uh, enable it through the Alexa app and it's called a way mode. And the way this works is that if you leave the house and you're a little concerned and maybe, you know, you don't have a security system, you know, you can't afford it or you don't want it or whatever, but you still want the house to be somewhat secure because you have an Alexa, maybe some other tech gadgets at home. You turn on a way mode and Alexa just puts on this conversation. And the one, there's a couple different ones. There's a, there's a couple that's breaking up. There's a mom singing to her kid. Um, there's another one about two guys just talking on a couch. I listened to one of them. First of all, it's not the greatest, whatever. You're not meant to be entertained by it. But in the sense of if someone is lurking around the house and they hear voices, more often than not, they're probably going to lurk away. And that was the whole idea behind away mode. Um, I wanted to try it out just to kind of see what it would be like. And um, it's uh, it was it was pretty hilarious. You know, it kind of reminds me of Home Alone where he sets up that yeah. whole scene <laughs> where he's, he's got all the puppets moving in the background and he's playing that bad music and the dolls dancing around exactly. the room. Yeah. Um, exactly like that. I think that's kind of ridiculous, but uh, anyways, we bring up this, <laughs> we bring up this topic um, because of a Forbes article that came out. That's uh, they're estimating that uh, actually it wasn't, it wasn't Forbes. They reported from Gartner original source or okay. states that 30% of um, thirty percent of searches are going to be voice searches. Um, did I get mm. that right? Thirty percent, I think. Um, well, it doesn't really matter the statistics. What matters is this is coming in large waves, and people are talking to their phones more and more and more and more and more. And the question that we have here is how do you how do you optimize for voice search? I mean, we we've got a pretty good idea, or else we're 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 starting to think that we have a pretty good idea of how to optimize for uh, written search. You know, landing page, right. blogs, that that nature. We have no idea what to do yeah. for voice search. So, I don't know. But from your your take, Francis, how do you optimize for voice search, and and what does that mean for creating content? It's funny. I was just training a new writer today and um, talking a little bit about the differences between you know when you write something that's meant to be read versus when you write something that's meant to be um, uh, like a script, you know, spoken out loud or. Or, or even kind of performed. And there is a difference. You know, there's a certain um, turn of phrase you might you want to use if something has to be spoken versus read. Um, you'll be um, less, you know, verbose either way. Um, I find this interesting because it's, I mean, we're taking a massive leap into the future here. We have, we're assuming that there is even a way to get voice analytics for some way to kind of, you know, get the data out of someone's voice or what does that mean? Um, tone versus, um, you know, uh, how fast someone is talking. Um, 
I don't know. I knowing how much information you can get from you know an, a Google Analytics now based on the written word. Um, what would it mean if we transfer that into a voice? You know, does tone suddenly matter more? Um, does uh, urgency what? somewhat matter? All right, I got a, a um, couple are, couple <laughs> comments on that. Like, what? Yeah, uh, yeah, you get really mad at your kids and you you scream. Put my kids. Put Sedona on timeout. Like. <laughs> Is is uh, Alexa going to respond faster? Is she going to be more stern with your children in, in response? Like, <laughs> like what, what does it mean when a, an AI is trying to decipher urgency? <laughs> First of all, we're talking about searches, not like putting my kids down to bed. You know, you're obsessed about me parenting through the AI. I am <laughs> yeah. not yelling oh, yeah. at Alexa to put my kids to sleep. Um Second of all, I think I, I want I, these are more wonderments. I'm wondering if urgency has anything to do with people's psychological um, how, how they psychologically think about, you know, what they want or what they need, you know, versus yeah. something that might be, you know, less like more casual. You know, hey, I'm wondering, uh, do I need a new pair of shoes? You know, what kind of shoes do you have out there versus, you know, black shoes now? You know, I need black dress shoes right now. Also, we're not we can't be talking like that in like these keyword phrases. You know, we can't say like, um, yeah, you know, great restaurant in North Carolina. We don't talk like that. You know, these are maybe certain ways to kind of, you know, have keywords or keyword phrases, you know, wrapped up into uh, into content. But conversations and interacting, that's yeah. completely different, you know. Well, there's a couple things on this. Like we're going to, as SEO guys like me, we're screwed because they've already taken out the the queries people use, like anybody that searches something that's wall logged into Gmail, that's a protected search and it doesn't show up in our analytics. Mm. They pulled that like three or four oh. years ago for privacy purposes. Um, yeah. I yeah. have no doubt that they're going to be doing the same exact thing for voice searches and probably even more so because that feels even more private than typing something into a search bar. I so agree. I don't think we're going to have yeah. access to that data. Um, another thing is I think that this is a lot more these types of searches are going to have more of a play in the B2C space um, and just like the pure consumer space. Because I think the, the majority of these types of searches are going to be, hey, where are the, you mentioned it, where's where's the nicest restaurants? Um, where yeah. is, yeah. Uh, yeah, tell me where this is or help me shop for this thing. And it's usually some sort of durable good or food, right? Like it's, it's, a, it's a packaged good that you're going to be getting. It's not content marketing solutions. You're not going to ask Alexa, um, you know, who's the best content marketing agency? There are certain mm. things that are going to be reserved for actual, you know, search and doing things on a desktop. So that's where I fall on that one. And how that kind of translates into, you know, being the answer. You know, if I'm asking Alexa, what is a good book to buy on management, you know, I'm going to assume she gives, what, two, maybe three choices? How do you get in those? I mean, maybe it's not even going to be about page one anymore. It's going to be like top three. Uh, can you be the top three choices or answers um, in the, uh, in, 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 in the, uh, for, for the AI to kind of speak mm -hmm. back? Um, I don't know. It's a weird world to think of. Um, you could even argue the fact that maybe it's not even about like, voice search anymore. Maybe it's all about conversa digital conversations. Because like I was alluding to, you're not going to be talking in these keyword phrases all the time. Right now, the most annoying thing is that I have to press a button or I have to say Alexa. If I just suddenly say, you know what, I really could use some tacos right now. And suddenly my lamp says, hey, you know what, there are tacos down the street and it's on sale. Is that going to be our future? And is that something I want? I don't know. God, I but hope not. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? On that terrifying... Uh 1984 yeah, feeling yeah, note. Let's end there. Let's <laughs> let's let's jump before I start to have a panic attack. <laughs> Number three. Number three, Jeff Baker. Yep. Um let's do it. Are you ready? This is the one um that we classified as die. <laughs> Going from 1984 to uh just <laughs> flat out just die. <sighs> okay. Are Four. you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Here we go. 20 second download, Jeff. What content marketing things should die? Go. Okay. Use these target keywords. We still <laughs> people still say that we still get that. You get like this list of keywords that uh, somebody, some crappy SEO agency has given somebody, and they said use these target keywords. Like what? 
where? Like just scatter them in the blog? Just say them out loud? Um, Stop. Oh, that's yeah, it. Twenty just, seconds. I, I honestly just, thought you would just be, you know, just write down the list like this, 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 this. No, you just really dug in deep with that, uh, with that targeted keyword list. No, that one weighs heavily on my mind. So I had to, <laughs> I had to unburden that on the rest of you. But let me explain in a little bit more detail. It's like there was an old school way of thinking back uh, SEO, maybe you know, seven, eight years ago, where you, keyword density yeah. was a word. So the idea was that. <laughs> You write a bunch of blogs and you use a keyword, you know, in a target keyword, like if we're a content marketing agency, you would write a blog and somebody would say, hey, you have to use content marketing agency twice in that blog. And somehow you try to, you know, cram a a square block into a circular hole and it would come out all really awkward. And somehow the, the thought was that it was going to boost up your site as a whole for that particular keyword. Um, that maybe might have worked for like half a second and (laughs) what happened was like it just it just got out there um and people still believe it like it's one of those things that just caught on that people were like oh yeah that makes sense use these keywords and content Um, i even had a client come up to me one time and say you know i read this article and it doesn't feel like it's search engine optimized well what would (laughs) be you know (laughs) Let's and, talk uh, about feelings and data, which is your favorite two topics. <laughs> I'm not going to, yeah, I, I will not go too far down the road, but you get what I'm saying. Like this is a, I do. It's I just do. Uh, misconceptions about SEO that just drive me crazy. And, and the reason they drive me crazy is because um, it's, it's not helping them. The people that bring up these things and they, they think that they know what they're talking about. It's not, it's hurting you. So somebody needs to get out there and say, stop doing this. I have. I I said this at our in our first episode, and I I still reiterate it, man. The problem is still you because <laughs> your knowledge has to go out there. Your knowledge has to be out there so people understand why they're wrong. Because you're right. You know, there was a, a half a second where that was true, where people fell. Here's your list of targeted keywords, and we're going to run at it. I know that. I wrote that content. You know, back in 2008, 2009, that's exactly what everyone was told to do. Um, but that that idea has persisted. And I, I'm guessing it's because it was the first idea that showed up, not realizing that the whole thing would have to evolve every six or seven months. It felt like it evolved beyond that. And yet here we are, you know, almost 10 years later. And somehow that idea, that strong first idea continues to kind of live on you know, due to you not talking to more people. So again, it's your fault. (laughs) Again, it's my Um, fault. Okay. (laughs) So the way the, the, the content marketing things that should die, we should, we should, you know, give credit where credit's due. Um, The content marketing Institute put a uh, article out mid, mid, uh, mid August, a couple weeks ago, about a whole big long list of um, quote, cringe word, cringe worthy content marketing things that should die. And they asked a bunch of different people, um, you know, what their takes were and, and so on. Um, and Jeff, I've sent you this list, and so now you can kind of you can kind of reference this. Um, but anyway, this is kind of where the idea came from. And I thought, again, asking you, I would get like a rapid fire thing, but no, clearly there is a deep <laughs> something deep and like anchored there with the targeted keywords. Um, but go beyond that. What else in your in your uh, in your mind should uh, you know perish perish a digital death? I did have an initial agenda, and I, I think I've fully satisfied that. Uh, yeah, a couple of these, a couple of my favorite gems that stuck out here. Um, one that resonated with me the most, stop calling it GIF. It's GIF with a hard G by, uh, at BH Rome at CM world. Um, I am fully on board with that one. Okay. I know everyone's going to come screaming back to me saying, Hey, the person that created the first GIF says it's pronounced GIF. All right, well, look, let's break this down. Okay. (laughs) The acronym, graphical interchange format. It's not, it's graphical, not giraffical. Not (laughs) giraffical, not like Jiffy, you know, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Uh, Case closed as far as I'm concerned and GIF just sounds better. So I'm, I'm with you on that one. Um, Another one that got me by at Carl Sagas, Sagas, S-A-K-A-S. Let sleazy webinar promotions end. Stop over-promising education for a thinly veiled sales pitch. Ooh, that's heavy. That's true. I mean, I 
just in general, thinly veiled sales pitches are always um, are always something I've, I've constantly told clients and writers to like avoid. Like even when when someone's saying like, "Well, we have to mention, you know, who we, you know, the service or the product." It's like, yeah, that's great. You don't do that. You know, halfway through a blog or at the end, yeah. um, it's just it's it, people get it, man. You know, it's not two thousand eight or two thousand nine. People understand how um, you know digital content works. They know exactly more often than not, maybe even more than you, where this content is being directed. Yep. Here's another one. I wish every single article that starts the seven things dot 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 would die by at Ron Tight. So, you're just you're just rage baiting me now, man, because I completely agree with that. I feel like that's <laughs> something that has been completely overrun, and I, I understand why. It's got it's got its roots in in classic advertising, you know, uh, back in the fifties and sixties. Um, that was the way to grab attention. The problem is that now that we're in a digital world, that can be repeated constantly and everywhere it was different when it was like one ad in one little town that suddenly said oh wow this is amazing and now it's like one ad of like a billion in the same sort of like you know region um even people that are playing with the numbers instead of 12 it's 13 or 17 things like it's suddenly different because there's an odd number i'm done man i don't want to click it i think it makes me mad that i want to click it still because there's a number in it and i i physically try not to because it, it bothers me that much. It's yeah, I'm kind of mixed on that. I am totally on board with that. And I think it was a huge fad. However, it works, man. Like some of our best performing ebooks, they've got numbers in the titles. They've got either a year or statistic or a list. Um, man, what am I I'm not gonna, you know, cut off my nose to spite my face. You know, I'm not gonna I don't agree with it, but it works. So I'm a numbers guy, man. I got to go with I'm it. not saying, I mean, look, I, I understand statistic and even year. I get that. I'm just saying the lists, man. Let's kill the lists. I don't need seven things. How many things do you need? I just want something else. I need I need one thing that works really, really well. That's what okay. I want. You, 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 think about, <laughs> you think about what you want, what you really, really want. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Wow, you're gonna quote Spice Girls right now? Is that what you're gonna do? Is that yeah. what this uh, this podcast has kind of resorted to? I I burned out Toto, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, last the, last one, last one here. All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, marketers need to get better now, smarter now about how to leverage Instagram stories. Let me l- let me add a little bit to it. Um, they say that they wish what they wish would die is long form video content that isn't broken into bite-sized chunks. And this person expects this person is, um, at a H a V a L a at a Haval, um, expect to be strong. Instagram stories will be a hit for a long time. Marketers need to get smarter right now about how to leverage them. Your thoughts. I I agree. I think they're eye catching. I also think they could be part of a, of an overall strategy. It should be part of an overall strategy, you know, um, breaking up a longer video into like bite-sized parts. I can understand why I'll be honest. I've probably made that suggestion in in the past. Um, but it it doesn't mean to suddenly the bite-sized part should be in another medium and another, you know, wave of, uh, a, a way to distribute it. Um, there is a power in Instagram stories. There's a power in Instagram period. And I agree. I don't think it's been utilized to its full potential. I think there's something else there that could be, uh, that, that could really kind of emerge from it. You know, something that's uh, an ongoing thing, you know? I mean, you got Instagram stories in there. The fact that that hasn't kind of like leapt into kind of a, that is a little bit more about story or there's a plot or there's something else that kind of brings it around um, tells me that we haven't utilized it to its full potential. There's a lot of creative stuff you could do with that and we haven't we haven't touched it. Yeah, and I think we need to get on it because in the last closing thought on this is Facebook is dying. I don't care what anybody says. Um, they've got a reproducible product and people are using other products. I mean, they're using Snapchat. They're using Instagram more than Facebook, I believe. And Facebook numbers are declining. Um, this was something our generation got into. And the new generation is like, well, hell, there's a ton of things out there that are just as fine, if not better than Facebook. And they're using Instagram a lot. Uh, so it would be silly for us to ignore that. I mean, there's, 
the people are there. The young people are there. Um, it's, it's something that we need to get, we need to get better at. So I agree with this quote. Here's the I one last thing for me. We had, we had, uh, uh, interns this summer and we were talking about, um, I was putting up a client's website or whatever. And she admitted to me that, um, the only way she knows about new brands or new things to buy is from Instagram. It's the only way she knows. There's no other way for her to kind of get re get, no one else can kind of engage with her unless they're on Instagram. That's all the, the only person or only thing that tells her, oh, this is something new. You should try this. I mean, imagine that for a second, how small that window is, you know, into that person's Instagram account and the fact that you, she is absolutely a person you want to engage, you know, um, young person, has got some money to spend, wants to spend it on something. The only place you can get her is Instagram. That's crazy. Yeah. So, I mean, don't mess with that, right? Just go for it. No. Let's just uh, jump right in. Um, and with that, we end episode seven of um, Above the Fold with Jeff and Francis. I want to thank everyone for listening, especially our loyal, what, maybe three listeners now, maybe Trace. Um, as always, as always, we're looking for uh, uh, comments, reviews. Um, if you can, uh, review us on iTunes. You can find us on Spotify, um, Anchor. Um, please give us suggestions. Um, we have an email address. Um, I believe it's above the fold at brafton.com. We also have a Twitter account. Jeff Baker, tell everyone about our Twitter account. That is at Brafton Pod. That is our above the fold uh, official Twitter account. Just started about a week and a half, two weeks ago. Which I'm realizing now we, um, we are not very active on our own Twitter account. I, th- I was looking at it the other day, and I think we uh, we got to step up. You know, in the vein of jumping in Instagram, man, we uh, we have not jumped into that. So let's let's do better. Oh yeah, just leave that on me, Francis. Let's do better. Okay, <laughs> sure, no problem, buddy. Oh boy, till next time. <laughs> All right, see you, everybody.